This is Joana Saira with a live session around the Beledi Awadi, the Beledi progression. I was supposed to do this session on YouTube, but my live stream software decided to go nuts. And this is what we do at the Beledi Awadi and also in life. We improvise, we work with what we have, we are flexible, we accept what comes and make the best of it. So. Here we are starting our live session where I'm going to answer some of the most popular questions around the theme of the Beledi Awedi or progression. Now, for the ones who don't know what a Beledi Awedi is, I have a lot of resources at my YouTube channel, Juana Seyda's YouTube channel. You can go and check, search for Beledi Awedi, you will find a lot of Beledi progressions, meaning performances uh, in Cairo and around the world, stuff that I did with different musicians. And you'll also find uh, instruction videos, educational videos telling you more about it. For the sake of this session, I'm just going to give you a little context. So the Beledi Awedi or progression is a traditional format of Egyptian dance, if you like, Egyptian oriental dance that is structured, but also improvised. Okay. So what is the structure in order to know it fully? I would highly recommend that you uh, join my new online course, how to dance a ballet Yawadi, because I'm going to go deep into the structure, but I can tell you right now that it obeys to certain stages or phases that are going to take you from your womb, from a very intimist, a very private, emotional, circular place to what I call the peak of the mountain, uh, the ecstasy, the celebration of life. So it's like a journey, okay? It is like a crescendo, a progression. You go from one place to the other, always going up within a structure that both musicians and dancers know, okay? Within that structure, we're supposed to improvise. So here's the big magic or part of the big magic of the Bele Diawedi. You're supposed to improvise inside those units, that structure, that progression that takes you from the womb to the world. Okay. And of course, one of the questions I will answer in this session has to do with improvisation because this is a hot topic for the answers. How do you improvise inside of a Bele Diawedi, right? Uh, what kind of qualities do you need to develop in order to be able to dive into the unknown and somehow make something unique out of it, right? So I'm going to um, suggest that you share your questions. If you're watching this live, feel welcome to share your feedback and questions. As it stands, I'm going to answer the questions or some of them I gathered from dancers, from my students, um, dancers who have met me at Joanna Seda's online dance school or in my private coaching or in work around the world. I have selected a few because there were hundreds of questions, <laughs> literally, and I cannot answer them all in a live session, but I think the ones I selected are going to help a lot of dancers out there. Okay. So I'm going to read from the questions I have selected. Uh, Marion asks me, you mentioned Bele Diawed is improvised, but you taught a choreography. Why? So she's talking about our free live dance masterclass that has already happened on how to dance a Bele Diawed. And I did uh, teach them a little bit of the beginning of an Awed choreographed. Now, if it is traditionally improvised, why do I teach a choreography? Very good question. First of all, if you study with me extensively in a proper course, you're going to be able to work on your choreographic skills as well as improvisational skills. Now, when you teach Ballet Yawadi, especially to foreigners, non-Egyptians, you need to give them, first of all, the structure, second of all, vocabulary, dance vocabulary, specific gestures and positions and postures and poses and movements that are directly related to this particular style. If I just open a class and tell students improvise <laughs> and give them nothing, 
uh, two things are going to happen. First of all, they're going to think, why am I even here? I can improvise by myself in my room. I don't need a teacher to tell me improvise, <laughs> you know, because improvisation without education is just improvisation. You know, you, you may know nothing about Beled Yawadi. And if all you do is improvising, you will remain not knowing a thing about the Beled Yawadi. So if you take a class or a course on Beled Yawadi, and this is my position, of course, other teachers may agree or disagree, you have to give your students the basic vocabulary, the basic postures and poses and movements and expressions of this particular style. After they have all that material, all that vocabulary and information, not only in terms of movements, but also in terms of the Beledi culture, the Beledi character, the Beledi mentality, then you will create a space for them to improvise and to dive into their own Beledi Awedi freely, but with knowledge. It's completely different from telling students, do whatever you want and give them zero knowledge. That is, in my opinion, the, the road of lazy ass teachers or, or teachers who don't want to share or cannot share the information. OK, so the reason why I will always teach my students to improvise and also to learn the basic vocabulary, at least basic vocabulary of that particular style is because I actually want them to learn the style. I just, I don't, I don't think it's enough to tell them do whatever you want and they don't need a class for that. And they definitely don't need to pay a course to hear someone telling them do whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> um, now also Marion says having a choreography puts me under stress and cuts my creativity. Then again, this is a very good question and it's not only uh, belonging to the Beledi Awadi, right? The, 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 the fight, let's say the battle between choreography and improvisation or choreography and freedom of speech, if you like, is a very old one. Many dancers will go towards one extreme or towards the other. They will either memorize choreography after choreography without ever developing their creativity, without ever improvising, or they will go the other extreme. <laughs> they don't want to know about choreography. They don't want to know about language of the dance. They don't want to learn the vocabulary. Basically, they don't want to learn anything. They just want to do whatever they want with zero knowledge to back them up. Now, as a teacher, and specifically as a teacher of Egyptian dance, I feel it is my responsibility and honor to teach my students everything they need to, to, to have in their luggage in order to improvise with creativity, but also with knowledge, with know-how. If we're studying a foreign dance style, Egyptian dance, Argentinian tango, salsa, African tribal dances, you name it, flamenco, you need to know the vocabulary and you need to know the technique and the musicality and the way that particular music and dance operates and the meaning behind that dance. You cannot ignore all of it. And choreography is a way to pass this information on. It's a vehicle. It is not the end. It is not the goal. I often tell my students, use my choreographies creatively. OK, so break them apart, rearrange them, add your own stuff, redo them, forget them and do them again. Be dynamic and be involved with the choreography, not like a masterpiece nobody can touch, but like a vehicle to learn the technique, to learn the dance, to learn the core of what you're doing, especially if it's a dance that is not from your culture especially if we're talking about a world which is not the world you were born in and the world you were raised at. So it's very important to understand, guys, that it really depends on what level you want to dance. You just want to use your creativity and remain ignorant. You're welcome to do so, right? If I put some Japanese music on and I'm totally or very much an ignorant in Japanese dance, I can improvise. You know, I can follow the music and do what I have in my heart and use my creativity. But does that mean I'm doing Japanese dance? Right? 
Okay, so it's very important that dancers of all levels think, do I really want to learn how to dance or do I just want to move as I want? <laughs> because these are two very different things, okay? So for me, choreography is not uh, something that necessarily uh, cuts your creativity or, or makes you feel in st under stress, like Marion says, under stress. No, 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 no. Um, choreography is a vehicle for your development, technical development as a dancer, period. And it has nothing to do with not using your creativity. You can work on great choreographies that will educate you, give you technique, give you know-how, give you experience, and at the same time, be very creative, do your own sequences, improvise, or even put your flavor on the choreographies that you learn. Okay, so one thing does not uh, go against the other. They work side by side. Okay, then also Marion uh, speaks about something that I found very interesting. She says uh, there are certain registered movements in our body versus the learned technique or movements she may receive from teachers. And from what I understood, and this is also a very good question, um, she finds a little conflict between the two. As if the movement that we have naturally coming from our bodies was superior or more important than the movement we learn from teachers. And then again, this is a, a conversation for a long, long, long <laughs> session. Because there is the movement we learn, the standard language we learn in different dance languages. And there is the movement we already carry in our body, our natural movement, our organic movement, like walking, like breathing, like running, you know, and they do not contradict each other. The same way uh, working on choreographies and technique do not contradict or do not stop you from using your creativity. Here, you also have to understand, or you can understand if you like, that there are two parallel worlds wherever you're learning a new dance style. It is what you already carry in your system. And these are the beautiful movements that will come out to the surface when you improvise freely and they're so precious and you should listen to them and you should embrace them and cherish them. But there is also the dance vocabulary, dance technique you learn from your teachers. Then again, I'll give you an example. I grew up between Portugal and Spain, okay? So most of my childhood I spent in the south of Spain and one of the first dances I studied was flamenco. Now, of course, I am a born dancer. So there was a lot of movement that was coming naturally. Nobody had taught me that movement. I knew instinctively how to move to certain sounds and beats and rhythms, but that did not mean that I didn't need to learn the flamenco steps, the flamenco formats, the flamenco rhythms, the flamenco um, soul, the flamenco expression. Yes, I was allowed to express myself and to let my body uh, improvise and bring what it had inside. But at the same time, if I wanted to know flamenco for sure, I had to take classes. And I had to watch the experienced dancers who had carried the heritage, the tradition of those movements, of that technique from generation to generation. It is a question of respecting the organic movement you carry within, at the same time, respecting the standard vocabulary of the dance that you are studying and the ancestors, the generations who created it sustained it, preserved it, and brought it to you right now. It's a question of humbleness in a way. So you need a lot of self-confidence to allow your body to bring forth what it has inside, and you need a lot of humbleness and discipline to recognize that that is not enough unless you just want to be a great improviser of no dance at all. Just, you know, do your own thing, and you're not learning a new dance style at all. You're just doing your own thing. Like a, like a child, like a baby, <laughs> okay? If that's your thing, be happy and do it, why not? But if you're learning Egyptian dance or any other dance style, it's not possible to ignore the dance and just do whatever comes to your head, you know? 
This reminds me of another story. Many years ago, before I moved to Egypt, I was teaching a class in Lisbon. And uh, there was a, a dancer who was teaching at the time, just like me, and she was taking my classes, right? And I noticed that during an exercise, she was totally out of the music. She was ignoring the music, like the music was not there. Everyone was going like that, and she was going like, She didn't care about the music at all. So I got close to her and I whispered in her ear, darling, you're totally out of the music. And she told me, darling, I dance to my own music. <laughs> I swear by God. And I just left, you know, because I thought, oh my God, what arrogance, no? What arrogance. If we are dancing with music, we have to follow the music. We have to dialogue with the music. I cannot ignore the music and say, I will dance to the beat of my heart. I don't care. So if you want to dance to the beat of your heart, don't dance with music. Dance in silence. If you dance with music, be humble enough to listen. <laughs> listen and work with it. Otherwise, why you are using music anyway? For what? If you're not using it in the end, right? So it's pretty much the same, guys. Nothing replaces anything. If you want to study Bela Diawed or any other style within Egyptian dance or any other dance outside of the Egyptian dance world, always combine, if possible, the creativity, the improvisation, the organic movement with the knowledge you gather from exterior sources, from teachers, from books, from videos, one thing empowers the other, okay? Very good. Now, uh, Svetlana, another beautiful dancer, asked me to tell you about a little bit about musicality and self-confidence in the Bella Diawedi. Woo! So these are very big subjects and I'm not going to be able to develop them in a live stream session that is supposed to be short and empowering. But I chose a few items that I would like to share with you that I believe can be helpful, okay? So first on musicality, it goes very much in the sequence of what I was telling you that when you're dancing, you're in dialogue with the music, right? So musicality starts with the acknowledgement that you are not working alone. You're not alone. You're working with a huge tradition, very old tradition on your back. And you're also working with music. I usually say music is your first dance partner. If you ignore your first dance partner, you are lost. <laughs> so musicality starts with sharpening your ear and really putting a little bit aside this notion that I want to shine and I want to show them how great I am and leave your ego a little bit to the side and ask yourself, what is this music about? What is this music telling me? What does this music make me feel? What's going on in this music? What is this style? Is it Shaabi? Is it a Baladi Awad? Is it a Baladi song? Is it Um Kulsum? Is it Abdul Wahab? Is it a Saidi piece? Is it Nubian? Is it something from the Mawalid? Is it what? This curiosity for the music, this, this interest in the music is the beginning of musicality. The problem is so many dancers don't care about the music. It's almost like the music is optional, like the, the dancer I told you about, like she was ignoring the music and she told me, no, 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 I'm dancing, I'm dancing to my own music. I don't care about the music you have on. <laughs> and this is crazy, you know, because one of the, the, the principles of good Egyptian dance, not only a good Baladia wedding, is your ability to listen. Okay, so first of all, acknowledge the music. Just acknowledge it. Pay attention to it for real. Okay, this is the first thing. Second thing, mix your knowledge of the music with your feeling of the music, which are very different things. The knowledge of the music is the awareness of what you're listening, right? So what am I listening? Oh, I'm listening um, Al-Fulila Uleila by Uncle Sum. 
This is classical Arabic music, and the rhythms that I'm listening are this, and then we have the first couplet, we have the second couplet. This is knowledge about the music. You recognize the style, you recognize the structure, you recognize the phrases and the instruments and the rhythms, but then comes the feeling. Dun, 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 tira, tira. How does this affect me? How does this make me want to move? This is not knowledge, it's feeling, it's instinct, right? When Um Kulsum starts, Ya Habibi, at the first couplet, Ya, Ya, Ya Habibi, Ulelu Sama. What does it mean, Ya Habibi, for me? Ya Habibi. How does it touch me? How does it move me? As a dancer, I must be emotionally available as much as I am available right here. Because so many dancers know how to listen to the music intellectually. They know what they're listening, even Egyptian dancers. They're listening. They know what they're listening and they understand the lyrics and they know the singer since they were born. That doesn't mean they feel the music. <laughs> that doesn't mean they feel the music at all. Feeling is another thing. Knowledge is one thing. It's very important, especially if you want to be an advanced dancer or a teacher or a performer, or if you're just so curious and in love with Egyptian dance that you really want to know it in depth. But feeling the music and allowing it to move you into that state of tarab, Allah, you know, being dragged by it, this is another game. <laughs> and musicality is basically... And that's all I'm going to share for today. It's basically the ability to acknowledge the sound, to acknowledge the music and to feel it from your heart and to really connect with it on a personal level. Okay? There's so much more about musicality, of course, but I think these two notes are going to be helpful for everyone who, who is inside of the Egyptian dance world. Now, confidence. <laughs> Self-confidence. Okay. Then again, a big subject. Let's see if I can... Uh, resume a few a few tips, a few directions that may shed some light on this, right? Now, the first thing I want to tell you about self-confidence is that it's very unpopular. <laughs> so many dancers will refrain from developing their self-confidence because they know they will gain uh, haters and antipathy and people who feel annoyed by their self-confidence, okay? So this is like a silent enemy. <laughs> you know, we're often sabotaging ourselves in our dance and in our life because we're afraid of silent enemies. So I guess nobody has ever told you, you should not feel self-confident. If you do, you will annoy me. <laughs> I think nobody has ever told you this, but you have annoyed someone, I assure you, anytime you came forth in full self-confidence. Anytime you came forth and said, this is who I am, this is what I stand for, and I love and respect myself. This annoys a lot of folks. So the first thing you got to be um, conscious of is that whenever you want to increase your self-confidence for your ballet or for anything, just because, you're going to have to expose yourself to the annoyance, the irritation the hate of everyone else who has not come to that self-confidence place. So if I'm not self-confident, if I feel I'm not good enough, if I don't really like myself, if I don't respect myself, if I feel I don't have something interesting to contribute, to give to the world, if I don't feel I'm an interesting person, I'm gonna hate the hell out of anyone who shows up in front of me with confidence because they're going to mirror my lack of confidence. And that is disturbing. It's very unpleasant to say the least. Okay. So the first thing you got to know is that self-confidence comes with a price. And uh, if you develop it, you got to be able to pay the price, baby. No, but no, not everybody will like you. And a lot of people will dislike you and hate you just because you love yourself. That's it no particular reason you don't need to kill anyone or to steal anyone or to hurt anyone just your existence will irritate them 
<laughs> because you reflect their lack of self-confidence, okay? You got to come to terms with it and you got to be empathic and, and wish them love. And if possible, advise them to search for help, you know, to increase their self-confidence so that they don't feel annoyed next time someone shows up in front of them actually loving themselves and celebrating themselves. So this is very important. Second thing, self-confidence is not arrogance. So arrogance is about thinking you are better than, okay? And of course, as a coincidence or as a, a not coincidence, as a consequence, <laughs> um, thinking that you will be inferior to someone else because whenever you put yourself in comparison, I'm better than, you will always be less than someone else. If you put yourself in comparison to other people in order to feel like you're more than someone, rest assured at some point you're going to feel less than, less than someone. So these are two um, sides of the same coin. Okay? And you got to be aware of that. So arrogance is about presuming you're more than other people. You're better than other people. You are the king and the queen and the diva of all divas. Self-confidence is about knowing that you are unique. You're not even comparing yourself with anyone. You don't want to be better or worse than anyone. You couldn't care less about divas and, and who's the queen and who's the king <laughs> because you are yourself and nobody is you and you are nobody else but yourself. It's like comparing an apple to a, to a pear or to a strawberry. How would you compare them? If they're totally different, a strawberry doesn't turn to the apple and says, you know what? I'm better than you, baby. <laughs> or, or vice versa. You know, they just know if they had <laughs> awareness that they're different. But we humans, that we consider ourselves so developed and so civilized and so ahead of everyone and everything and so much wiser than nature. But we're not. We're not. You know, we're not. So we think that we have to compare ourselves all the time in order to know who we are and where we stand. And I'm here to tell you that self-confidence in your dance and in your life is all about knowing and owning your uniqueness. And that also means you stop comparing yourself with others, period. You're not better than anyone. You're not worse than anyone. You are you and you are doing you. Okay. And when you're dancing a ballet de wedding, which is so personal, it is so personal. If you're not totally comfortable with this uniqueness, it's going to be a disaster because you're going to try to emulate, to mimic other dancers, perhaps your teachers, but you're never going to bring your, your movement, your flavor, your presence, your uniqueness to the table. So you will remain a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of. And that's not what a ballet diawadi requires. And that's certainly not what Egyptian dance requires. Now, so much more to be said about self-confidence. I'm just going to share one last uh, information or tip. And then we move forward because I still have a lot of questions to answer. And I promised my beautiful dancers that I would address them at least shortly. Okay. So if you want to develop your self-confidence, first of all, pay the price and be aware that you're going to annoy a lot of people and it's okay. <laughs> Second, own your uniqueness. Stop comparing yourself with others. And third, don't be afraid to bring out your best, your best qualities, your best characteristics as a dancer, as a person. So if you ask me, what are my best uh, characteristics as a dancer? In my opinion, of course. I would say freedom, I would say uh, creativity, I would say uh, feeling. These are fortes in my dance. What are my fortes as a human being? I'm very brave, very brave, and I love that. I'm honest, and I'm very resilient. I, I love it. When I dance, in a Bella Dia Wedi or anywhere else, I'm bringing these qualities with me to the table. <laughs> okay, so in order to build your self-confidence, you got to own your good stuff 
and your bad stuff too, your flaws, your blind spots, and work from there, of course. So self-confidence, guys, is an essential treat for the Bella Diawadi and for everything. And I do hope that despite the annoyances <laughs> that it may cause, uh, I hope you develop it, okay? Now, Gina, another dancer, uh, asked me, in what circumstances did the Bella Diawadi become a stage dance? And this is a question for which I don't have an answer. I don't think anyone knows exactly. So when I moved to Cairo to start my career, or even before, when I was just studying in Egypt, okay, I saw a lot of Baladi progressions, a lot of Baladi Awadis, not in the five-star places. This was not something you would see um, with the five-star dances or, or not five-star dances, five-star places. It's different. Um, you would see this in, in cheaper nightclubs, in more modest places, more modest venues. So it was not trendy because then again, it's Beledi. It's associated with Beledi people, with common Egyptian people who, by the way, are the best people I've ever met in my life. But that's another conversation. Uh, on Sunday, we're going to have a live session on the Binter Beled. You don't want to miss that. And I'm going to tell you all about the character of the, the Beledi people. I'm a Beledi, by the way. I am Beledi very proudly, very proudly. So I don't know the exact moment when the Beledi Awadi was put on the stage. And I believe nobody really knows it, okay? But what I can tell you is that it was not something you would see a lot, at least when I moved to Egypt. It was not trendy. I think it comes and goes. So we have uh, performances of dances like Nagwa Fuad. Just a few days ago, I had a student at our school, Joana Seyra's Online Dance School, sending me a video of Nagwa Fuad doing a Bela Diawadi. Ah, one of the best things I've ever seen. So good, so juicy. Uh, but the fact is, it comes out and in, and it goes in and out of fashion like it happens with a lot of stuff, like dancing with Sagat, for instance, you know, it goes in and out of fashion and nobody really knows why. Okay. So I'm going to leave this one open. If anyone knows the exact moment when the Bela Diawadi was put on the stage, please let me know. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know the answer. So um, I'm open to any clues. Okay. Then Asphalt, another beautiful dancer that, uh, that is with us at Joanna Seda's Online Dance School, she says, um, oh, she's telling me about a story that I told uh, around my orchestra in Cairo. So when my accordionist um, suggested that I close my eyes in order to help me get into the mood, into the mazeg of the Bela Diawadi, she asks, um, why did he suggest it? Was I having some difficulties? And the answer is uh, no and yes. <laughs> okay. So I think every dancer has a very particular relationship with her musicians. If you're lucky to have your own orchestra, and for almost eight years I had my own orchestra in Egypt, and then when I left Egypt and started traveling the world to teach and perform, I worked with different orchestras that were not my orchestras. Okay, so it's very different when it is your orchestra, people that you hired, your musicians, who are you do every night, they are with you every single day, years in a row from an orchestra you meet in a weekend. For me, it's very different. And the relationship is also different. Okay. So the relationship I had with my musicians in Cairo was very intimate. It was like a family to me. They were, still are in my heart, like a family to me. And that meant that I asked them a lot of questions and I knew they could teach me a lot. Guys, let's not kid ourselves. These guys, at least the musicians I had in my band, some of them like Mohammed Damanhuri, the, the, the accordionist, he was in his 60s, 70s, you know, these were men who had always worked in the field of Egyptian music and dance. My accordionist had come from a family of Beledi accordionists who had lived for generations from the work of the Afra, the, the weddings, Beledi weddings, okay? So, of course, this gentleman brought so much knowledge, so much luggage, so much experience, how could I, a foreigner of 23 years old, 
know anything, <laughs> you know, when compared to the knowledge these musicians were able to give me. So I was a, a boss, but I was also a student of my musicians without them noticing. <laughs> okay. So very often, every time I sat with rehearse with them, I would tell them how I wanted the music. Of course, I was the one orchestrating them for different reasons that I'm not going to go into right now. But I was also a student. Maybe not officially, but I was. So I would sit and ask them questions. I would ask them about dances they worked with, uh, about Nagua Fuad, about Suher Zaki, about Lucy. Some of my musicians were working with Lucy as well. I asked them about the music, about new composers, about new songs. They were bringing material for me to listen every single day. We would sit and they would tell me, Madame, I I want to show you something. I would sit with my coffee and listen, 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 listen. They were my masters. They were not only my musicians and my family and very often my bodyguards <laughs> when things got crazy. You know, they were my teachers. So my accordionist told me to close my eyes. He often gave me tips and, and, and information because he knew I could feel deeper because he knew that with the little bit of guidance, I would go to the core of the dance and I would feel it and I would present it on stage. And that's exactly what I did. So very often, at least with me, I don't listen to musicians because I don't know what to do. That's not the reason. I listen to them because they can teach me. And I will always be a student of anyone who can teach me something. Always. All. It doesn't matter if I've done my job for 20 years, if I've proved myself a thousand times. I'm also a student above everything. And if I see a teacher, any teacher, musician, dancer, non-dancer, stranger, who can teach me, who can improve me, who can take me higher and deeper into my craft, I'm going to listen to them. <laughs> okay. Um, and then she, she says, Asphalt says, when I thought about the introduction to um, the Bele Diawed in your show, so when I started doing Bele Diawed in my show in Cairo, um, oh, she asked me if I talked with Mahmoud Reda about it. And what did Mahmoud Reda think about it? Okay. So at this time, I was already um, not working with Mahmoud. I was studying with Mahmoud Reda. Working with Mahmoud Reda came later, a few years later. I started as his student. But I went to Mahmoud mostly for the folklore, for Nubian, for Saidi, for Hagala, for the Reda style. I did not go to Mahmoud Reda specifically for Raksa Sharki, which was, by the way, an area that he didn't consider his area. So if you talked with Mahmoud Reda, he would clearly tell you, I stand for the Egyptian folklore. Oriental is something else. Okay. So years later, as I started to work with Mahmoud, aside from studying with him, Mahmoud Reda would often redirect his students to me whenever they wanted to learn a Bela Diawadi or Om Sum or anything Oriental, because he considered I was best suited to teach them than him. Okay. So I did not speak. I don't think so. I don't remember. And I would remember. I did not speak about the possibility of doing a Bela Diawadi with Mahmoud Reda. And even if I did, I'm pretty sure he would tell me, do what's in your heart. Either way, I know nobody can stop you. <laughs> <laughs> because he knew me very well and he knew that I'm very stubborn and I always do it in my heart. Sometimes it works wonderfully. Sometimes it works terribly and I pay the price. It's okay. It is my choice and it is my decision and I follow it. Okay. So Mahmoud Reda was later on delighted to watch me uh, do the Bela Diawadi. He would often come to see me perform. And as far as I remember, he always loved it and he never advised me not to do it. Not at all. Okay. That was uh, the advice of the musicians initially because they thought doing a Bele Diawed in my show was not uh, dignifying, was not, uh, was not going to give me the image of a sophisticated, glamorous star. Okay. And then they changed their mind because the Bele Diawed really worked wonders and other dances even the dancers at the five star hotels who were not doing it for a long time, they started doing it again. <laughs> okay. Now, 
Um, I have a few more questions. I will try to be short and objective. Um, someone, I didn't write the name, sorry guys. Someone asked me why the Awedi, why not Beledi in general? And um, what's the difference between them? Okay. So look, and, and this is a really big question because there's a lot of confusion around the term Beledi, right? Beledi is not even just a dance style. Beledi comes from Beled, Beled, which means homeland, country, the place where I come from. Yani Beledi is my homeland, it's the place where I come from. So there are many things that we refer to as Beledi. Uh, beledi uh, bread, Aish Beledi, or a Beledi coffee shop. Uh, or a baladi person, a person with a baladi character. I Opa, this <laughs> baladi character, a uh, baladi way of living, a uh, baladi resourcefulness, baladi places, baladi uh, clothing, a uh, baladi um, way of speaking. We refer to baladi to many things, the baladi rhythm, of course. And then there is baladi music. You have songs within the Beledi style, and then you have the Beledi Awedi. So we can have very different elements here. I can have, uh, for instance, Tutune, an old Beledi song. Tutune, 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 Tutune. This is a Beledi song, it is not a Beledi Awedi. A Beledi Awedi is, as I explained, an improvised, uh, structured, uh, instrumental piece where you will only have the accordion and the percussive set, tabla or darbuka, the holla, if, if there is a holla, hopefully there is, uh, which musicians call el ard, okay? So the holla is el ard, the floor upon which the tabla is going to improvise and create details. The doof, the rik, uh, perhaps sagat or tura, it really depends on how many musicians you have uh, at your disposal for that beledi awadi. But the beledi awadi is not a beledi song. So you have beledi songs with lyrics and uh, um, even with other instruments to the mix. And these are two different worlds inside the same world of the very wide and beautiful beledi universe. Okay? Now, she asks how to start the Beledi Awedi and how to stay in the here and now with confidence and lightness to improvise within the appropriate movement vocabulary of a Beledi. It's a very complicated, very complicated question. I will try to simplify it and to give you something useful here. Okay, so how to start it? We start inside our womb. Okay, so usually we start with what I call getting into the mood in the mazeg. I will start by listening and grounding myself. This is where you should actually start. Even before you do the taksim, the solo with the accordion, you should have already put yourself and your musicians in the mood, in this flow. Okay, so we start getting into the mood of the music and into the mood of the moment and then we go into the taksim, the, the, the solo with your accordionist, with this intimate, beautiful, quiet, almost like whispering conversation. This is how we start, okay? How do you stay in the here and now? Now, this is a big, 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 big question. <laughs> how do you stay in the here and now? Uh, okay, so let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. If you are always thinking about what comes next, if you're always worried about, am I doing okay? Am I doing all right? Am I impressive? Am I interesting? If you don't surrender, let go, and allow yourself to react to the music and to act, co-create with the music second by second, you're not gonna be in the here and now. You're always gonna be projecting somewhere else. You're either gonna think, what did I do? Was that impressive? Or you're gonna think, what will I do? <laughs> okay? So the thing and the magic about the Beledi Awed is that you're not supposed to think about the past or the future. You're supposed to be so in the moment 
that you're gonna co-create with the music second by second. And the only, um, the only way to get there, to that place of confidence when you're not projecting yourself into the past or into the future, is really to trust yourself a lot, trust the music or the musicians if you're doing it with live music, trust life and be totally okay with not knowing what's gonna happen. If you are a control freak, <laughs> don't do ballet Yawadi. <laughs> don't do it because it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be a nightmare. <laughs> you know, you're not going to enjoy it because it's going to be very stressful. So we got to come to terms with not knowing what comes next and accepting that sometimes it's going to be fabulous. And sometimes it's going to be a disaster. And sometimes you're going to embarrass yourself. I remember a couple of times when I actually cried, cried during a ballet Diawadi, guys, I cried and I ruined my makeup on stage. It was not planned at all. I felt mortified and I even fought the tears because I didn't want to ruin my makeup in the middle of a show and look like less than professional and composed, but I couldn't stop myself. It happened. Why did it happen? Because I was in the moment. And because the synergy between what my musicians were feeling and doing that day, what I was feeling and doing that day, and what the energy of the moment was, created those tears. And I had to allow those tears to come forth. Did it look like a mess? Yes. <laughs> Did I feel embarrassed and even a little amateur? Absolutely. Was it real? Was it a real ballet Wadi? Oh boy, it was big time. And of course, people loved it because they could feel the truth of my tears. They could feel the truth of the moment. Yes, it was messy and chaotic and ugly. And I had, all, you know, mascara all over my face. It was a mess, but it was real. It was raw. It was honest. It was unpredictable. And this is um a proposal <laughs> of being fully human and vulnerable and saying whatever happens happens man <laughs> even if it's messy oh i'm here with my heart open so let's see what happens you know it takes a lot of courage coeur and act courage comes from coeur le coeur the heart acting with the heart from the heart that's the real meaning of the word courage and acting from the heart will put you in trouble a lot of times. But is it the right thing to do? Certainly in a ballet Yawadi and probably in life as well. So confidence, I already answered. Um, and um, how do we improvise within the ballet Yawadi vocabulary? She asks. And this again goes back to the first questions that I was answering. If you are studying a specific dance style, you should always combine, in my opinion, the standard technique. This is why we take classes. This is why you subscribe to an Egyptian dance class, because you want to know the technique and the music and the culture and perhaps a choreography. Not necessarily, but if a choreography is being used, you're also going to know and want to know the choreography. But then there is the, the, the learning, the memorization of that vocabulary, of that ABC, and the way you're going to use that ABC and other movements that will come spontaneously from within in order to express yourself. So if, if you want to learn Egyptian dance or, or, or Japanese dance or Chinese dance or flamenco or, or African dances or salsa or any, any dance, if you're interested, you have to learn the vocabulary, the technique, the background as much as possible. And then you use that vocabulary to express yourself and to expand your language. So there is the language you learn from teachers and the language you carry within. A combination of the two is what we're going for, at least in my work. That's what I do. <laughs> that's what I've done always as a dancer and that's what I do as a teacher, okay? Then again, if you're not interested in learning and all you want is improvise without knowledge, 
why would you pay for a class? Why would you spend money and time and energy on a class when you feel you don't have anything to learn? You just stay in your room and improvise. Do whatever you want. But don't call it Egyptian dance or don't call it flamenco or don't call it, uh, you know, uh, Russian dance or don't call it, you know, salsa because it's not. It's you doing your thing. Okay, so a combination of education and exploration is what will uh, take you far. Okay, I have videos about this um, in my YouTube channel, Atchwena Saida's YouTube channel. So I suggest you go there and check it. Education versus exploration, very important. The same dancer, which name I did not memorize or write, sorry for that, uh, also asks, what's the personal mindset for the Bele Diawadi? I'm going to give you a few notes here, okay? First of all, you got to be in the mood to enjoy yourself. Uh, it's very different from being in the mood to impress people or to impress yourself. Oh, I'm going to be so impressive. Woo! I'm going to show them the flick and the flack and the kick and the cock and the belly tricks with coin, without coin, with circus, without circus. No, 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 no. The mindset for the Belediya Wedi is I'm going to enjoy myself. You have it? Ay, waqueda! You have to be in the mood for love. Something like this. You understand what I mean, right? If you're not in the mood to enjoy yourself, you're not in the right mindset. Okay? So impressing someone comes from the ego. Enjoying yourself comes from the core, from the heart. Core. Il core. The heart. Okay? So the first thing is being the mood to enjoy yourself. The second thing I already mentioned, don't control the outcomes and don't project yourself in the future. What am I going to do? Or in the past, did I do okay? No, be in the moment and accept what comes as it comes and work with it and create with it, okay? Without judgment. Also, don't grab yourself to the illusion of perfection. This is a big one. Oh my God. <laughs> How many times have I listened to dancers telling me about this, that they're struggling with an ideal of perfection that very often their teachers tell them they should follow. And this is madness. It is madness. One thing is learning about the dance. And I'm all for that, you know. If you come to one of my courses at my school, in my work around the world, in my private coaching, you're going to receive real information about the entire thing, the technique, the musicality, the culture, the lyrics, the, the everything. But that doesn't mean that I will tell you this is how you should look like. And this is how you should move. And this is the expression you should have. And this is the result we're going for. No, 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 no. You are you. You do you. I will educate you from the perspective of the dance. But I'm not you. I'm not, I don't know how you're going to feel a specific music or how your body is going to react to a specific movement, for God's sake. So quit this ideal of perfections, of perfection that someone has told you you have to follow or that you decided you have to follow. Oh, in order to do a good ballet, I have to look like that. I have to behave like that. No, no, no. Understanding the posture and the culture and the dance is not the same as mimicking other dances, okay? Super important, guys. All right? Last but not least, the personal mindset for a Bele Diawadi is all about going very comfortably into your womb and really staying there and seeing what's there and then also comfortably being able to exteriorize and to connect with the outside world. You got to be comfortable at some point. Uh, got to be comfortable going in and out. You got to be comfortable with the silence and with the music, being loud, being subtle. You got to be versatile, okay? And able to dive deeply into yourself, especially at the beginning of the Awedi with the accordion which is a sound that is going to bring, drag you. It's going to bring you in. And then as the percussion uh, starts to get into the, the piece, the awedi, you start coming out. Okay. 
It's like going into your womb and then being born again. Okay. Now, how much do you follow the musicians and how much do you determine, determine the playing? Another very good question, guys. And I do believe this depends a lot on the relationship you have with your musicians. So with my musicians, as I already mentioned, I have a very good relationship. That meant that um, they knew me very well and I knew them very well and we respected each other, which is something that you don't see very often. Very often dancers don't respect the musicians they're working with and vice versa. And this would never work for me, by the way, but it happens, okay? Now, in my case, I had deep respect for my musicians and they had deep respect for me as well. So this meant that we, both of us, were creating. It was not me following them passively. It was me very often suggesting something in the music through face expression or a movement that I was doing that they were observing, they would catch and follow along. So I was as much of a follower as I was a co-creator of the music, especially in Abela di Awadi. But then again, it really depends on how comfortable are you with your musicians and how attentive they are to the dancer. There are also musicians who don't pay attention to the dancer. They just do their thing and they're in another world. They don't care. You can stop and they will keep moving. You know, they will keep going. So if you have musicians who are actually with you, present, paying attention, they will notice if you're suggesting something, okay? So in a Bella Diawadi, very often, I would suggest, for instance, speeding. Imagine that we were doing the, the, the taxim of accordion and it was boring, it was stale, we were not doing anything interesting, and I would say, okay, let's speed this up, tabla, taala, taala, come. Let's speed this up because we're dying here. And they would totally understand that and catch it on the spot, okay? Also the opposite. Very often at the end of the Awedi, I would feel I want to go into the Taksim again. I want to go back and explore that more. And I would give them the tip without speaking. And they would understand it. And we would go back to the beginning and play, okay? So it's all about uh, the relationship you have with your musicians and also how confident you are co-creating with them, right? So uh, what happens is that many dancers will think they have nothing to add to the music. They see themselves as followers, passive followers. They don't see themselves as active co-creators. So this also will stop a dancer from suggesting something, okay? They would just listen and follow without interfering. That is a question of you knowing yourself and you having the confidence to do it as well. And then she asks how to improve the ability to improvise the playfulness, the presence and confidence. Wow. Oh my God. I'm looking at the list of questions I have here and my God, I don't know if we're going to be able to finish them today. I think we will not. I will answer the rest in our upcoming session because there's a lot of questions. Um, how to improve your ability to improvise? Let's start here. Um, there are many exercises that I use as a teacher to improve uh, the improvisational skills in my students. And I think this depends from teacher to teacher. Many teachers will not think that improvisation is a big deal and they will not create the space and the safety and uh, the, the tools to allow their students to improvise. So these are the serial choreography memorizers, <laughs> not serial killers, the serial choreography memorizers. And I'm sure you know someone like that. They go from workshop to workshop memorizing choreographies, bam, bam, bam. And teachers who do that and, and they, they feed that, they don't really teach people they give them choreographies, that's it. And that offers dancers the illusion that they're learning how to dance when what they're doing is memorizing choreographies. And memorizing a choreography or learning how to dance is a very different process, okay? So the first thing you gotta do in order to improve your improvisational skills is to start improvising. And I know this sounds so obvious, <laughs> right? 
but it's not so obvious. Um, a lot of dancers will need uh, um, a very specific condition, you know, to improvise. Very often I've heard dancers telling me, Joanna, but I don't know enough to improvise. Before I can improvise, I have to have more experience, I have to be an advanced dancer, I have to study for at least I don't know how many years, I don't know the music enough, I don't know... Blah, blah, blah. And I can tell you this is nonsense. Of course, the more educated and experienced you are, the more you have to play with. Okay? Remember, Egyptian dance is a language. Dance is a language. So if I know a lot of vocabulary... I have more to play with and my improvisations, my writing will be fuller, richer, more well-informed. But does that mean that I cannot start improvising with a few vocabulary, a few words? We can, you can. I'm sure that when you started studying in, in school, when you started to learn how to read and write, you learned A, B, C, D, then you learned small words, sun, moon, hello, uh, hi, and you started writing simple phrases. Your teachers did not ask you to write a Shakespeare uh, sonnet, right? They asked you to write, uh, the sun is beautiful. <laughs> That's a phrase. That's a dance piece. That's a phrase. So the first thing I would like to tell is don't expect for the perfect moment to start improvising. Don't wait for the moment you feel experienced and knowledgeable and advanced to finally start to improvise. No, start improvising with what you have. Even if what you have is very little. I make my dancers, my students improvise with as little as three movements. Three words. They say, Joanna, what can I do with this? I say, I'll show you what you can do with this. <laughs> and they see, and they do it. And they see how much creativity they have in their system and how much they can create with so little. And the more you add vocabulary, the more you educate yourself and add experience to your background, the better you will improvise. But the thing is, don't expect for the perfect moment because that perfect moment will never arrive. <laughs> if I expected... For that perfect moment to start improvising, I would have not improvised one single time in my life because I still don't feel prepared. 20 years later, <laughs> having done everything in this field, you know, having performed in Egypt for almost a decade, having performed all over the place, all over the world, I'm still not prepared. But do you think I waited? No. You start working with what you have, okay? Second thing is... You really have to go beyond what people teach you, right? So, so many dancers will learn the vocabulary, the dance movements, and they stay there. They repeat the dance movements, but they don't expand. They don't create other movements from those movements. They are not even invited. They're not even told they can do that, which is worse. And then again, we, we go back to the responsibility of the teachers, right? What are we doing as teachers? Are we just providing dance technique, dance vocabulary, or are we providing the conditions so that our students can develop their creativity, their identity, their self-expression, their imagination, their visualization? So it's so important for you as a dancer to learn the vocabulary, but then ask, now what? What can I do with this? How can I reinvent these movements? How can I expand? How can I make the same movement slightly different, perhaps in a different direction or with a different body part? And from that point of exploration and expansion, you start developing yourself as a dancer and as a creator and as a... a um, as an identity, as an identity that can actually express that identity, that can actually create something of unique from that identity, not only from what others are teaching you, okay? Last but not least, in order to improve your improvisational skills, you need to be very, very aware that choreography is important. Woo! And now, <laughs> oh, some dancers are going to hate me for this. Choreography is important, Joanna. What the hell are you talking about? We're talking about improvisation. And then I'm going to tell you a story. When I started working with Mahmoud Reda, 
I was already studying with him and I was uh, telling him about uh, choreography. I was sick of choreography. And of course, I was starting to work on his choreographies to teach them within. So I was forced gladly to learn his choreographies. But choreography was not some, something I enjoyed. Okay, I had spent my childhood in classical ballet training, memorizing choreographies. Choreography after choreography, I was sick of it. And in my shows in Cairo, because I changed my program constantly, there was no time to choreograph. I was improvising everything. Actually, every uh, recorded performance I have on the internet, if you go on my YouTube channel, is fully improvised. I don't have anything in choreographed for myself on stage. I choreograph for others or for teaching, not for myself. And Mahmoud told me something I never forgot. He told me, Joanna, if you want to become a better improviser, start choreographing. No, 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 no. What? No, Mahmoud. I am an instinctive dancer. I like to improvise. It is my forte. Why do I need to choreograph? I don't see the point. I don't see the relationship. He told me, okay, you don't need to understand it now. Just start doing it for me. Can you do it for me? You don't even need to use the choreographies you're going to create. You don't need to teach them. You don't need to perform them. Whenever you come to my studio to work with me, let's stay like one hour plus. Let's remain one hour and I'm going to stay here with you and you're going to do your own choreography just for me, just as a favor. <laughs> and I did it and I did become a better improviser. He was right. Go figure, right? Mahmoud Reda was right. Go figure, how strange. Because when you start choreographing, independently of using the choreographies or not, you come to terms with your own skills, with your own knowledge, with your own creativity, with your own limitations. Choreo choreographing is a big, big uh, check on your humbleness. It's, it's, it can be a slap in the face, I tell you that. Because as an improviser, you feel on the spot, you feel so fabulous. But then when you choreograph and you really gather your bearings and see what do I have, what can I do? You often face your limitations. I knocked my head on the wall literally many times as I was going through those first choreographies with Mahmoud. Because I felt, oh my God, suddenly I don't think I'm that creative anymore. Suddenly, I don't think I'm that knowledgeable anymore. Suddenly, do I even know what the hell I'm doing here? And I was already performing every night with full houses. I felt like an imposter. So for me, it was a breakthrough. You know, when I started choreographing just for fun, just for exercise, just for Mahmoud, I did become a better improviser. He was totally right. So the last thing that I would tell you that many of you are not going to like is that if you want to become a better improviser, start choreographing your own stuff <laughs> and see how far you can go with your creativity and don't expect perfection then again. No, 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 no. Do what you can with what you have and, and, and you know, the more you know and the more you have, the better you will do it. But you can only become better by doing it. Here's another very big key. And if you don't take anything else from this live session, take this. Very often people think there is a magic formula or a moment of enlightenment <laughs> that will make them a great dancer, a great this, a great that. There isn't. You can only become better at something by doing it. And at first you're going to do it lousy, you're going to do it poorly, and then you get better. And as you keep doing it and keep dealing with the great stuff and with the nasty stuff and with the average stuff, you're going to get better and better and better. So there is magic in doing, in action. Don't stay in your head, criticizing others and looking at what others are doing. No, 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 no. Do your own stuff. And then you will have no time or willingness to criticize others. And then you will see how difficult it is to, to create. It is easy to destroy and to criticize. Very easy, but it's so hard to create. This is why we have more haters than creators. <laughs> Don't be a hater, man. It's not cool. Be a creator. So keep doing it and doing it. Start improvising even if you have very little knowledge. Even if you're not sure of what you're doing. 
Connect with the music, feel it. Use the movements that you know. Ask for help, ask your teacher. Teacher, can you give me a little bit more technique so that I can play with it? So that I can choreograph a little bit more or so that I can improvise a little bit more or with more colors to play with? You know, just do it. And of course, do it with your heart. So I have a lot of more questions. I thought I would have time to answer them all. I will not. On Sunday, I'm going to meet you either here on Facebook or at my YouTube channel. Actually, this was supposed to happen in my YouTube channel. So either way, you're going to know all about it. And the second session on the Ballet Yawadi will be focused on the Bintel Ballet. Okay, a very beautiful subject that uh, most dancers don't know about. And also, I'm going to answer the remaining questions about the Ballet Yawadi, which are a lot, still a lot. Okay, I hope this session was helpful to you, was inspiring. It's going to be available in my YouTube channel as well. So if you're watching this on Facebook, uh, feel welcome to subscribe to the YouTube channel and watch it or rewatch the video in the YouTube channel. If you are watching this directly on YouTube, because I'm going to upload it there, subscribe to the channel as well and uh, subscribe to our newsletter, Joana Saida's World Newsletter. You're going to find the link for that in the description box below this video. And I will suggest that you check our new online course, a transformational journey called How to Dance a Ballet Yawadi, starting very soon at Joana Saida's Online Dance School. The information about the course is going to be shared in the description box below this video if you're watching this on YouTube or in the comments to this post on Facebook. Either way, you're going to have the link to follow and know all about this course. We're going to go deep. We're going to go high and hard into the beautiful art of the Ballet Yawadi event. Okay? I love you guys and I will see you very, very soon. Until then, you're going to receive my warmest love and my Ballet kiss. Ai, <laughs> See you soon, guys.